It's Tommy Green. That's right, Tommy Green. <laughs> sitting right in front of me. I've never done the intro with a human in front of me. Usually it's just my kids. <laughs> Tommy Green runs against traffic. He ran across the state of Utah, I think in 2018. And he does a lot of other stuff. And many of you will know him from his other things beyond running. But I'm super stoked to have him on here with me. Yeah. You check this part out. It's too damn cold to run. It's too damn cold to run, Tommy. It snowed today. It did. What now? It's time. For the DFL Before DNF Podcast. Welcome. Tommy Green. Thank you. It's too damn cold to run. Uh, all right. I'm usually all alone when that happens, so it's good to have you here. I love it on every level. With me while I'm doing it. Thank you. Uh, all right. So the DFL before DNF podcast, this is all about really season one is called Late Race Survival, and it's all about my journey to figuring out how to keep going uh, when I want to stop. Late Whoa. in a 100-mile race, my issue mm-hmm. is, not, is, is rarely physical. It's almost always mental. And so I've been on the hunt for people who've done really cool things, big things, things that would have been easier to quit than to keep going in the realm of uh, running. Sure. Talked to some pretty great people at this point, some really interesting people at this point. And then I thought the other day about what you did. Yeah. And I thought, well, let's, I want to hear about that because there's so much of the advice I've gotten. There's different things. Jesse Rich, who we yes. talked about you on that episode. Oh, Cool. You know, Jesse is, uh, you know, a brilliant nutritionist and uh, incredible runner. Yeah. And he, um, you know, we talked about like how 30% of the calories you consume go to your brain. And so if you're on a long run and you're not eating, yeah, it's not going to your, you, you're, you're losing brain power. And of course that brain is going to try and get you to stop. And yes. So it's been extremely practical on, on all those levels. But, and, and today I want to talk to you about your run across Utah. Yeah. But before we get there, I want to get to know you as the person. Okay. Tommy, Thomas Rada Green the Third. <laughs> yes. Sir. Yeah. All right. Like my father and his father before yeah. him. Absolutely. I, I've talked to many juniors, but you're the only third. <laughs> that's cool. My son is the fourth, and my, no way. My dad calls him Ivy. So that's, like a, <laughs> that's like a whole thing. Well, so, Tommy, tell me. Uh, I, th- I think the audience is gonna is gonna dig your angle on stuff. But I, uh, where did you grow up? Where are you from? All over. Really? I, I was born in California. Mm-hmm. Moved to St. Louis, parents split, dad stayed in the Midwest, my mom and I moved back, uh, was in the Bay Area for a while, moved to Washington State, and mm. would visit St. Louis every summer, Dang. and then I moved to Salt Lake City uh-huh. my 10th grade year from okay. like Tacoma, and so moved down here, East High, Leopards, baby. Dang. <laughs> That's where you graduated from? Yeah. What year? 99. 99. Uh, um, okay. <laughs> So Tacoma, I know, you know, at least maybe back then was more blue collar than it is even now. What what were you doing up in that area? What were you doing in all those areas? Okay, so I'm a little guy in California. That's cool. Yeah, I landed, dude. I landed in Seattle, kind of well, Puyallup, up like this little. Oh yeah, do the Puyallup, baby. Um, I yeah. landed there in 1991, right when everything was exploding. Okay. So I got there. My stepfather was in youth ministry. Okay. I was not a fan, but I was a fan of all the kids in the youth group that were all these like musicians. They were into like everything. So that's where I went from stealing the red Disney cassettes that were like the storybook cassettes. And I would, (laughs) I would record slick Rick and like easy on them and hide them from my parents. So I went from, okay. So they would think that they were these wholesome, because they wouldn't let me listen to music, dude. It was like full on like Southern Baptist, satanic panic. You know, you can't listen to music except I'm like dying to listen to music. So hip hop. And then I, I land in Washington Uh and I hear, um, dead Kennedy's, um, sound garden, Nirvana and crass. And I was like, I Dang. need to play. These guys are playing their own instruments. This is incredible. Yeah. And so and that was 91 that you got there. So, I mean, yeah. when did Nirvana blew up in like what? 92, no, no, 93. That was it. it was happening. It was right 91. Then. Nine, yeah. Just, I mean, late eighties, early nineties was when okay. that was going. So I, I got there, I'm like a whoa. fifth grader and all these kids that are 13 to 18 are into all the best Dang. stuff. So it was a That's perfect crazy. time to like, 
fall in love with music because the, yeah. the music scene in Washington at that point, everyone listened to everything. So yeah. I listened to classic rock. I listened to like punk and hardcore. I listened to like everything mm-hmm. and just was like, want to play drums. That's it, all I want to do. It's hard to think of a, another <clears throat> moment in the last like 60 years where there was one single space that was so important to the culture of the United States Dang. all at once. Like Seattle, early 90s influenced America like this seems like like, like no other in the last in my lifetime now 40 it's, years now it's like the entire hip hop scene has taken that role like it is the punk rock scene like you go to the shows now everyone's stage diving and they're like it's, it's wild <laughs> but yeah I think that's weird even in being in the underground music scene for a long time mm-hmm. it did feel like in the 90s up till the early 2000s that like different cities and regions had their own sounds almost now everything's kind of all the same but anyway so yeah Yeah. so washington state moved here from there Mm -hmm. and had kind of no grid for what this place was yeah and um yeah so anyways i came here in 10th grade graduated did stuff and then i got i was involved in the music scene as like a punk rock kid out here and then became part of a couple different hardcore bands and um was i was really struggling in high school with like um, substance abuse and I could feel like addiction kind of like yeah. in my, it's in my blood, yeah. you know? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I kind of, uh, I made some pretty dumb moves in high school and then ended up getting kind of like straight and was like, I ended up going to the hardcore scene and hung out with a bunch of kids that were drug free and was like, can you guys help me stay sober? In and they Salt were, Lake. Yeah. In Salt Lake city. And so some of my homies in high school, I started going to shows with them and fell in love with, uh, hardcore music and it, it the intensity and the aggression and the, lyrical content and the not following a typical song structure and just yeah. all that stuff and uh, became part of the hardcore scene out here and then moved to Southern California um, a few years later, like early 2000s mm-hmm. and got involved in a bunch of groups out there. So okay. was out there five, six years, became a member of a few different bands, started a band with some friends as a singer in a band called Sleeping Giant okay. and needed to move back to Salt Lake. And then the band kept going in California. So I landed here and got, I got a job with Wells Fargo Bank so I could be back here. <laughs> While you were in Sleeping Giant? Yeah, dude. I like, I was so out in California. I was, <laughs> I was out in California and I was like, you know, doing, I, I was doing all sorts of stuff out there. And my, uh, my ex moved back to Utah with my daughter and I didn't have a way to like get back here. So I came to visit and saw the Wells Fargo building downtown Dang. and was like, dude, dads work at banks, right? Like I, yeah. could, I could get a job as a what, bank guy. What year is this? 2000 and five okay i was a teller uh from 2000 <laughs> exactly 12 months that was all i could do it i was really good i always could like my it always balanced oh my god 12 months the year of 2003 yeah dog it's you know those are good years <laughs> were they <laughs> good bank, good banking years <laughs> oh my gosh yeah so i got out here with the bank and then um i would be a bank uh you know, service manager. And then I'd fly back to California to play shows. Okay. And then I'd come back. So I was in a band for a long time and that's kind of where, <clears throat> kind of where my running journey started hmm. was when we, we, I jumped, the band just started growing and in influence. And I, I was like trying to just be a responsible guy out here. I'm like, yeah. listen, I only get my daughter half the year. I can't tour the other half. So yeah. I just kept saying no to everything. Hmm. And they kept, building better offers for us. And so the very first tour our band did was a full U S co-headliner with a bunch of other people. It's just like really? we went from zero to like, yeah. Top so, of the bill. so for context for, you know, my, my audience is, is, you know, runners who do it because they love it. We're not yes. like standing on a podium. It's just like a, an intense, deep love. And, uh, some, when I announced that you're going to be on the podcast, reached out like, I'm so stoked. Tommy's going to be on. I love oh, Tommy. Cool. I'm a fan. That's awesome. uh, and then, Thank you. but for those who, who don't know who you are, tell, tell us a little bit more about Sleeping Giant because you kind of glazed over, even though you were kind of starting to get into it, but like that, that, that was a, that was a movement. You yeah. Know? That, that yeah, was yeah. big. There was, um, like I said, I, I learn the hard way, Yeah, <laughs> but I do learn. So that's great. I just, I, <laughs> my journey into music started kind of, you know, removed from any level of like uh, belief or conviction outside of just being sober. I was in animal rights. I was like a vegan kid for a really long time. Okay. And then when I moved to California, um, in that season of time, I, I really made some really horrible decisions against kind of my own soul hmm. and, and the need for, or the, the desire for something deeper kind of entered the picture. And so I became a Christian in 2000 and I don't know, I don't have a date in that time. Yeah. And, uh, there's a huge, uh, Christian 
movement within the hardcore scene. And so, um, it's just rated R, it's like rated R spirituality. It's like just real life. It's like real people. That's like what we're doing. So we're playing shows and on tour, like, you know, touring and playing shows with all of the bands. Um, so Christian and non Christian. Yeah, dude, satanic black metal band. We played festivals, satanic black metal bands. We played with like mad atheist, hateful, hardcore bands and we're friends. You yeah. know, it's like you just you do life together. That's yeah. it. So, you had your thing. They had their thing. Yeah. yeah. And everybody had respect for each other. So yeah. we collaborated. We had I sang on records with them. They would come and sing on records with us. And so it's this very interesting culture. Yeah. And so I was a Christian. I, I was sharing my faith a lot. And there was a there was a movement of bands from within the like almost like the spirit filled hardcore scene. And it was a wave in mm. that time. And yeah. so. It was. Yeah, it really like it went real big. Like I don't know how it worked because yeah. we weren't good. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's so many better bands out there yeah. and so many more talented musicians and and just incredible vocalists and stuff. But like for whatever reason we had favor and we had credibility. Yeah. And so we just kind of did a thing. So we put out uh we put out five records. Um, full lengths and we did maybe like eleven or twelve years worth of touring. Gosh. So we went all over the world and um played everywhere. It yeah. was awesome. So that's, so I was in, I was in a hardcore band that had this faith component and, and it was, that was why I was in the band was I wanted to help people where I had really struggled and I, I wanted to do for others what I wish would have kind of happened for me when I was younger. Yeah. <laughs> like trying to steer people. Yeah. Like, don't let my story be your story, please. Yeah. And so that was kind of it. So I was kind of a preacher guy. And then, um, on tour, you know, you, you, in, in a band, you, you're you working 24 hours a day for like 38 minutes on stage. <laughs> so you, you will drive like 16 hours yeah. to get to a spot. You got to load in. You yeah. have all your gear, yeah. merch track set up. You sit. Yep. And seven hours later, you walk on. Yep. And have a great time. And, and it's, that's impo it. it's important to note that like the upper echelon bands, they do even less. <laughs> so they have like my buddy Kenny was a drum tech for Chris Stapleton. And so it's like, and it was just like a floor tom, a rack, a snare, <laughs> three cymbals. And he was on tour with Chris Stapleton to set up those drums. So think about that drummer, yeah. his day, you know. And, and he's not Chris Stapleton, so he's not doing media either. No, he's just chilling. He literally comes out, plays drums. Dog, it's, it's so it's bananas. That's why, so for me, I, uh, Chrissy Green and me, my, my beloved wife, we, we, kind of what was it? It was 2000 and it was about a year after we moved here within the first year. Yeah. We moved into this condo and, um, through no fault of our own, the condo flooded in a rainstorm and us and like 13 other families got this place. We had to stay in a hotel for like Dang. three months. Oh man. We were on the verge of like, Oh, we had to, we had to file bankruptcy. Like there was this mad fight about it all. This is 2008 oh, is man. when it started. And so, I ran the Salt Lake Marathon, okay, 2009, and Chrissy ran the half 2009, and 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 what was weird was we were living, we had a family in our church, we, we couldn't go back to our house because there was like mold growing in the unit. No we're staying in this hotel, and then we got a note under the door that was like, you can stay in the hotel, but now you got to pay for it because the HOA isn't paying for it, the insurance company is paying for it. So like us and all these families had to like figure out where to go. A family from our church said, "There's an empty, we have a we have a duplex." Um, one half of it's empty. There's nothing in it. We'll turn on the heat and water. You guys can move in if you need it. Dang. So we're living in this like empty duplex in um, Mill Creek. And in that season, I started thinking I'd like to run. Hmm. And so we started running. It was almost like everything got hard. So we're like, let's just make it hard. Do something. Let's do. I mean, but there's something to that with running that I love. That's, I think that's how we're wired. It's like, all right. But but it's it's also like uh, it's it's a suffering I can control. Yes. Because every all the other suffering I can't. And so it's like I'm gonna still I still still something about suffering. Yes. But yes. I'm gonna go do something I can control, and then I can stop and come home. I, I remember. So I, I started running here, and and I remember thinking like I'm gonna I'm gonna run. And me and Chris, for whatever reason, were like, let's do this. And she's a yoga teacher in town, and mm -hmm. so she'd been doing other stuff, and we just started running together. And so that was a season where I remember we were training, and I did uh, my long distance run, <laughs> no train, and no training. Two of my friends met me at Liberty Park, uh -huh. and my homie Adam ran the first. No, my homie Matt ran the first 10 miles around Liberty Park. Okay. <laughs> and then my homie Adam showed up 
and ran the, the next like 15 with me. And I'm like delusional by the end of it. I don't know anything about nutrition. I'm drinking water at the fountain. Like yeah, that's, that's I, did all that, I did that actually today. So that's, it's like, that was my training, you know? And then I fell apart in the Salt Lake Marathon. I think I finished like four and a half hours. I was trying to do like, that's great. trying to do like sub four. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah, man, I can do that. Chrissy green <laughs> leaves. They're like firing under the gun by the U like uh -huh. the starter line. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. in the line to pee. So I watched them take off and I'm like, Oh no. So <laughs> the first like literally eight miles of that race, I'm just trying to catch up to see if I can find my wife. So I did the half marathon. You did half of the half marathon. I did the, yeah. I, I saw her as she's turning around by Highland high, like hi. And then she yeah. had to go and I just had to keep going. Uh -oh. I finished the half marathon that year, one hour, 37 minutes. I was smoked like I hit mile 15 and was Dang. like I was going so fast and I'm like this is great uh, and, and then, then you finished in four and a half hours <laughs> <laughs> it was used to come back down 500 east like the length of the valley yeah you know you run out to cottonwood or whatever you know yeah and then come back and yeah. I I I fell apart by holiday like mm. I just I saw the timer and was like I'm doing great three hours and 40 minutes this is gonna be awesome and then just like whew, I, I mean, I, I went down the street around, I hit fifth and was just like, Nope. Oh no. Yeah. And so I totally failed on every level in yeah. my head. I was like, really, I had a plan fell apart. Yeah. So anyway, so we started running, but then on tour, when you get to a place, like you got to drive, you know, nine hours from blah to blah, you get there at nine in the morning. Yeah. You got to load in all your gear at 10 30 and then you're just sitting in a venue. And for me, I just, I was trying to make it better yeah. so i would <laughs> we'd load in or before load in i would wake up throw my headphones on and just give myself like two three miles yeah and I, and it was it wasn't fast but at least i got to put my feet down somewhere yeah i remember one of the more beautiful runs we were in canada mm. the bearing and the tit and the a bearing on the trailer exploded and the, the, one of our tires went flat on the van. So we okay. like pulled off the side of the road yep. and, and it's summer. So it's nice. We were in Quebec, Ooh. like on the side of the freeway. Yeah. They had to go get help and get like flagged down a car and they went up and then I knew they were going to come back. So I'm like, well, I'm just going to run up until I see them. And then that was it. So I got out and it was beautiful, like kind of Canadian summer weather along the side of the freeway. Just like, <laughs> you took I ended up running like nine miles. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, it was just like, Hey, but Why for not? me, it was like my, it was my ritual Absolutely. That just to, to say I'd been somewhere. Cause yeah. you only see the venue. Like yeah. you don't, it's, Oh, that's cool. So anyway, so that was where kind of running started for me. So I hadn't done it for a little while, but I was, I was in the band and that was kind of where the, the genesis of the big run it is it is it started because of the band, mm -hmm. but it had nothing to do with running. So, mm. so you, you 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 keep it alive. You know, you're running, you're doing it for for your reasons, mm -hmm. and then you decide to run across Utah. Yes, and get me from where you just left off. Yes, to so deciding I'm, to run across Utah. I'm, I'm not running. I'm not running for a few years. It's like, I, I kind of, I'm like in, in, in intermittent every yeah. once in a while, I'll throw my shoes on. Cause you just, sometimes it's like, sometimes the winter is like the best time in the whole world to run. Yeah. Cause you're like, this is where I'm getting stronger as a yeah. runner. Like yeah, there's yeah. a level of commitment that settles in that yep. dark season mm -hmm. where you're like, I'm here. Yep. Other times it's just like, I don't want to. <laughs> so I would just like, nah. so what ended up happening was we, we, we were contacted by a 15 year old kid okay. through my YouTube channel. I had a YouTube channel for sleeping giant and I would mm. make requests. Hey, if you guys need anything, if you need prayer for anything, please let me know. That was it. And yeah. I would do these devotionals for just hardcore kids on YouTube. Yep. And I got hit up by this young, it was like a 15 year old girl. And she was like, I'm in real trouble. I, you know, she didn't know anything about us. I yeah. don't want to talk to a teenage girl online. So yeah. I'm like, Chrissy, will you and our assistant, uh, Meg, at the time, I was like, we, we, can you guys reach out to her? See if this is real. Yeah. And it sounded like a real bad situation, like an abusive home and hmm. just like not good. Hmm. So <clears throat> long, very long story short, we, we ended up watching a kid go from a family to like a group home because her family was exploding to a family member kidnapping her out of the group home and trafficking her to a brothel. And she was found two days later with 14 other girls. Gosh. So I, we watched this journey go down and, and my wife and I are just like 
trying from a distance to help this thing. And we, we, it's a, it was insane. Mm. It was just the most insane story. And so, yeah. and I didn't believe it cause I'm like cynical and skeptical and I'm just, I, you know, so I'm just like, this isn't real. Like I'm just keep waiting for the other shoe to drop. Yeah. You know, you're gonna ask us for money or make fun of us or something. I don't know what this is, but there's, there's no way that this is true. And Chrissy's such a G mm. that she essentially would just stay in contact with these people. Mm. And at one point we were trying to actually like adopt her and bring her to be with us. And, um, it, it all just fell apart mm. in that story. In that time, this survivor said, you, Tommy, you have to keep sharing. There's many more like me. Gosh. And so it was heavy, super yeah. heavy. And yeah. in that time I was going to talk at some business events with a dear, dear friend of mine named Josh. He runs a, he ran a company in Colorado called Ruckus Apparel, runs a bunch of restaurant groups and stuff like that. And he's just a boss, but he would host these events in, in this dude ranch in Colorado. And he had like Ryan holiday out. He had like no, all I, these, so it would be a, a meeting of the minds yeah. and there'd be, it was like a Ted talk in the mountains for all these entrepreneurs and stuff like that. And so mm -hmm. he had me as a keynote, uh, three years. And so <clears throat> I'm there and I meet a guy and, um, his name is Mike. And what, one of the things that he did, he was in Nebraska mm -hmm. and he wants to help um, at risk youth and, and homeless youth. And so he skateboarded across Nebraska to raise money to build a skate park in Lincoln where he lives. Okay. And it, and, and it was like this whole thing. Yeah. And he had all these pro skateboarders that showed up thinking like, yeah, we'll skate. And so many of them bailed because it was so taxing, even physically to kick and push for that long. Yeah. And he just did it. So huh. I meet Mike, he tells me wow. this story and I'm like, wow, it's crazy. And, and he was just a friend, you know, mm -hmm. it's been a little while. And un unfortunately the girl that I'm talking about, she passed away. Oh, no. And so it was about a year of kind of silence. I hadn't really thought mm -hmm. about her that much. Mm -hmm. And I went on a training run. I live on the West side. And so I was running the Jordan river yeah. parkway. And I was just like, I hadn't run for a little while. And so I'm on this run and on the way back to my house, it was almost like I had like, like waves of, it was like some, it was like hit me. It was like, I'm going to run across the state of Utah. I'm going to talk about this girl at school. We're going to write it down in a book. It's going to become a bestseller. We're going to hmm. rescue a bunch of kids. Hmm. And then I just started crying. Hmm. So I get inside and I call Mike and I go, dude, <clears throat> I'm going to run. I can run. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to, I can run. I can, I don't skateboard, but I can run across. <laughs> and he's like, dude, write that book and run your ass off. And yeah. I was like, Okay. And so that was 2017. Okay. And I just decided I'm going to do, I'm going to go to suffer camp because I, lo I lost the ability to tell this story because hmm. I would have opted out. Hmm. I didn't believe it. It's going hmm. to, it's going to fuck me up. If it wasn't for Chris, I wouldn't have had the honor to bear witness. I would have bailed. Hmm. And Chrissy is the G hmm. it's her story. It's not my story. But I know people watch what I do and yeah. Chrissy Green is quiet and awesome <laughs> and fantastic. And I'm just like a circus of a yeah. human. So I'm like, all right, I will, I will go to suffer camp. Yeah. Chrissy tell the story. Yeah. And so that was like the, I'm going to do this stupid thing mm -hmm. because ultimately my goal with run against traffic was I just wanted to be able to look at everyday people and go, yo, I know you haven't run. I know you barely walk. Would you contribute? You know, I ran across the state and I'm not good at this. Yeah. Could you do a 5k? Could you, could you just jump in? Like, let's get people involved. Yeah. You know, it's kind of a typical model, I guess, of like a, a charity running community. Sure. It was just like, dude, I just wanted, I didn't want to ask anyone to do something I wasn't willing to do myself. And so I just figured, well, I'll just do this really stupid thing. Yeah. It's going to hurt real bad. This kid suffered, I'll suffer. And then that way people will know I have some balls and then mm. I can invite people to mm. join. Yeah. And that was it, but I didn't, I didn't know what to do. Hmm. So I reached out, I'm trying to think of who I talked to. I, I think it was just like a friend of a friend. They had, they had a homie named Emily mm -hmm. and she was, she was a running coach, a mile at a time running. Her name is Emily Sinone. She's like, she's a boss. She yeah. runs all the time, does training. She in runs Salt Lake? Like, she's here. Okay. Yeah. You should talk to her. She, um, she's who introduced me to Jesse Rich. Oh, really? So okay. yeah. So I sit down with her, I get connected with her. Hey, I want to do this audacious kind of run. She's like, I'm a running coach. I'd love to talk with you. So I meet her at public. Nice. We sit down. I mean, I met her at La Barba. Thank you. We're in the La Barba warehouse, Tommy. <laughs> Shut the fuck up about. I went to public. La Barba and I had the La Barba <laughs> I went, key. I went to. <laughs> <laughs> I went to La Barba coffee. And Inside I, public. And I, 
<laughs> and I sat down with her. I tell her what's going on. I'm like, I need to do this. And she's like, wow. Okay. And so we'd, we'd had some conversation before we sat down and then I told her, I was like, I'm, I need to do this. So hmm. she was such, she was so awesome to me. And so I used a, um, final surge was the training yeah, yeah. and, and just tracked, I just tracked all my miles and, uh, and she said for you as a beginner, ultimately to a ultra kind of distance, it was 426 miles from top to bottom. And wh- where was your starting point? Uh, the, the Idaho border. Oh, you started from the top. Yeah, okay. I started from the top. I didn't go across because I felt like that was some sissy. Yeah, crap that I would have just done, the, done. The, the panhandle of Texas. <laughs> yeah, that's just yeah. Yeah, that's, that's like it. sixty miles. I've run across Delaware. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> Rhode Island against traffic. So it was cool. So I went to the Idaho border, and uh, it was going to be four hundred twenty-six miles. And my goal was, if I could do thirty miles a day for two weeks, yeah, we're done. And so she was like, it's not really about, it was really interesting, her, her training model. And I feel like it could work for some people, maybe yeah. not. I think it could work for a lot of people, but she basically just said, what we're going to be working towards is just time on your feet. Mm-hmm. And so I was able to do the distance. I fell apart. So I'll tell you about that later, but like yeah. it, I, I ran four days a week. Okay. So I did, let's say like a three, and this is like, whatever be at the beginning. It was like a three, a four a six Mm -hmm. and then an eight. Yeah. And then it, it ramped up to where I would do maybe like, I got to look at the log, but it would, it'd be like a six and a half, a 10, a 12. And then my longest date was 20, 26 miles or 25 miles was, it was my longest run. Big weeks. But that was just, that was before we tapered down a little bit, but it was like, I just, it was just the time on my feet. It was like, you just got to get used to hitting. And so the, the Mm. bigger weeks I would run from, um, my house up to Capitol Hill. Mm-hmm. I'd run from Capitol Hill through the U District all the way out to Foothill okay. to the turnaround at the 215. Yep. And then I would just come back. And that was like a 20, 24 to 26 mile day. Hmm. And so that would just, I'd start in the morning. And so it was just like kind of building to that. And so I started at the Idaho border. <clears throat> um, <laughs> This is how like dumb. I, so I met with Jesse a handful of times too. Sorry. <laughs> She's like, I want you to talk to my friend, Jesse. He's a nutritionist. So Jesse came over and we just talked about, you know, sugar, good nutrition. He like yeah. gave me, you know, a, kind of protocols of stuff I should think about yeah. and every hour, what I should be thinking through and fueling your brain and, right. you know, so your brain doesn't kill you. And like, yeah. all these things. it's like, your brain is going to tell you to stop. And yeah. unfortunately, like, <laughs> um, you know, you can only go, I, cause that's, that's my thought was like, I, you're gonna have to gut some of this out yeah. at a certain point, but let's, let's make it as easy as you can on yourself, which yeah. I'd, I'd never done before. So, right. um, yeah, I would do my long runs with like two waters and be like, I'm killing it. And yeah. be like, what are you doing? Don't do that. <laughs> and I'm like, I thought this is what like hard ass runners did, bro. Yeah. Like Frank Shorter never did that or whatever, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> He ate ice cream once, probably. Or so I just yeah. I was like a moron. I didn't know what I was doing. So yeah. kind of did that. So the run, uh I, I started it um October uh of 2018. And I figured that'd be a beautiful time. Yeah. I wanted people to think yeah. like, oh, like Utah, it's pretty and I also was kind of trying to make it like a a moving meditation or a living prayer, like because I didn't know how long I was gonna live in the state. So yeah. I almost wanted it to be like if I've if I move from here, mm-hmm. I, I said like no, not here. Mm. Just absolutely not. Hmm. And so there was a, there was a, which just gets to the motivation was there was something bigger than me that I I was living. I was living in that experience like for, it wasn't dedication to something else. It it was not just for me. Mm. And it was not something that I knew how to do necessarily. I, I did my best to try to figure it out, but I got day three from I was like running through Ogden or something like that in Northern Utah and it started raining Mm. and I would never thought about in October. I'd never thought about like what to do if it rains. Yeah. (laughs) Like, Hey man, maybe keep your feet dry. Like maybe. So I just like kept running. You'd be a great hundred miler. We almost, everything's a surprise somehow. I do. I was like, what the (laughs) hell? Like, I, so I had a friend named Parker that worked at, uh, he worked at ultra. Uh And so he gave me, he gave me some shoes. So I was like, yeah, but they were like knit. So like, (laughs) I'm like, these are awesome. Did you you train in the ultras too? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So you were ready No, 
no, no I didn't. didn't. Oh, gosh. I did not. I trained in Hoka's for most of no it. No way. You went from Hoka's <laughs> down to Ultras. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, well, free shit. You know, I was like, oh, they're hooking I me up. I get it. I get it on Loyalty, that bro. Yeah. Loyalty. I'll Cavs. suffer for the game. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I, I'm doing this thing. It starts raining and I, I'm like aware that something bad is happening, yeah. but I'm like, I am three days in and yeah. three or four days in. I, I can't even remember right now, but I get to the end, take my socks off and I've just got blisters from yeah. my footbed to my heel. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know. And you're just why. in Ogden at this point. Dang. I'm day four of what should be like yeah. a 15, you know, thing. So I was in like, it was excruciating. Yeah. I, I didn't know what to do. Yeah. And so I'm running on these like weirdo blistered feet. And I don't. Did you pop them? What did you decide to yeah. do? You did pop them, and that sucked. Yeah. Did you? What? Do you recall? Because this is this is a very real problem in the hundred miler. Like some people are blister poppers, some aren't. I popped them at my first hundred, and I I regret it. So I, I don't pop anymore. I'm glad you're telling me this now. Yeah. If I'd have known, I would yeah. not have. Well, that's just me. But, but there's some people me nuts. that yeah. it drove me bananas. I was but, just like, I don't know what to do. A marathoner was pacing me in my first hundred miler, and I had the blisters. He's like, you got to pop them and put duct tape on your feet. And I was like, okay. I'll trust you. <laughs> that was <laughs> real bad. I just, idea. I would run. I noticed that I, what I would end up doing is I would do them in like three hour blocks. Cause I just, it, it messed my time up. Yeah. It messed my pace up so heavy and I'm, I'm limping. Yeah. So I would do the morning block, stop lunch block, stop afternoon block, stop. And it was basically like three hours. Mm. I, I just gave myself a couple hours nice. to get to each spot. I had my homies from uh, Mercedes Benz of Farmington, had given us a sprinter and oh, like cool. a, a minivan. So they would just pull up a mile in front, you know, and they just, it was like, we just yeah. slowly made our way through the state. So are you running on the highways the whole time? Just on the side? That's legal? I mean, it, you did Yes, it, it is, actually. Yeah. I, I checked in <laughs> with the highway patrol. No, I, was, I only got the cop, you know, the cops only showed up twice. Okay. And so that was, they were kind. They knew you by name <laughs> yeah, from just, your childhood. What's up, Tom? How you doing? And I said, hey, dude, don't. Anyway, so... <laughs> Yeah. So I, I ran for the next two or three days and I, it was like, it took about two, it took about two hours for my feet to go numb. Yeah. And then I wouldn't think about it as much, but yeah. when I'd stop to get food, it would be like, fuck, I have to start over again, you know? So, um, I did that for a few days and then what happened was my left side broke down. Okay. And so I, I was like, maybe at this point I'd gotten through the city, I'd run, um, down to, I was into Utah County. Okay. And so I'm going and I'm like maybe <clears throat> eight or nine miles into the day. And my left knee, like my whole like left side just like locks up. Okay. And I'm like trying to walk and I, I like can't, hmm. I can't move. Like yeah. it was the weirdest deal. I've never. So they took me to this guy, Tom, who is a sports a, a physician in Murray. Okay. And he did the like dry needle oh. with the, the things it's on my Instagram. You can okay. see it's wild. I've never seen that before, but like he finds like the muscles and then he mm. exhausts them so they can relax. Dang. Like he just, it was like needles into the muscle. So groups. like, he, like stresses them out to the max. So and they then just they give just, up. Yeah. Then they quit. It was <laughs> yeah. wild. Like he, on the video, it's like, I understand you watch that. him find it and yeah. he hits it. And my leg jumps off the table and almost like kicks him. And it was <laughs> it's Tom Fletcher. He's, he's incredible. He works yeah. with all sorts of uh, athletes out here, but yeah. Dr. Dr. Tom. So he's like, he tapes my knee up after that session. And he goes, you have to go home. And I'm like, I need you on camera saying that. Cause I'm not stopping. And he's like, no, no, no. I just need you to go home for like, and just rest for today. Cause we were still within driving distance of my mm. house. And so I'm like, all right. So I go home and I cut off it. I think it was like 10, maybe 11 miles that day. And I was like, Oh man, I'm like so far Behind. off. Yeah. So I go home, I rest the next day. I feel pretty good, mm -hmm. you know? And then I run for another seven, eight miles. And then my leg locks up again. So then I'm like, this is garbage. So I retape my leg. And then for the next like four or five days, I'm just walking. Oh. So I'm like walking and trying to hobble. This, and is, to this is a legit ultra recap. Like this is what it's like <laughs> in our, in our hundred milers. Like I'm actually surprised. I, I, I would have thought this is a road running thing. It's probably gonna be a little bit smoother, but this is real legit. No, it was, it, I didn't know what I, cause like literally Emily would be like, this is like an ultra. And I'm like, I don't think so. I think they go like really far at yeah. one time. I'm only going like 30 miles a day. That'd be fine. And she's like, no, like this is like, but you were also pounding asphalt, <laughs> you know, compared to dirt. I'm, 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 yeah, that, that, that hurts. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, so that was the thing. So I was, so I ended up just like, 
I, that's where it really settled into like, I have three hours to do 10 miles yeah. and I would just like walk shuffle as yeah. fast as I could. Three hour, three hour, three hour, okay. and knock my 30 so miles out. Now we're in the realm of like, teach me what, how did you keep going? Like what, yeah, thank what you. was it? Okay. Um, I, after the first girl passed away, we were chilling and it was probably nine or 10 months later. I'm at a conference in San Jose and Chrissy messages me and goes, did you get that email? And I'm like, no. And I open it. And at this point, some of the people that we feel like were complicit in the trafficking of this girl were coming after me and Chris. If I spoke somewhere publicly, they would come after us. If it was like, wow, we had to get the attorney general's office to issue like a cease and desist to some people. And so it was wow. just like, it was weird. Mm -hmm. And it felt like kind of like, man, this is now sketchy. Yeah. And so we get this email and it said, um, hello, I'm sorry. My English is, is not good, but I found, I found your email in a pair of pants. Um, this girl had given it to me when we were at this bar. She said, if I was ever in trouble that I should call her mom. And I'm like, don't answer it. <laughs> like it's the bad guys. Yeah. <clears throat> Chrissy, don't talk to them. She's like, what, yeah. what harm could it do? Yeah. So the second girl, she said, yeah, I was in that bar for about two years. And then this girl showed up and less than a week later, the police came and got us. Hmm. And she recounted this, this young girl that we were helping. She was 16 at the time. She said, um, yeah, she said every night that they were there that this 16-year-old kid would go room to room and pray for the other girls that were there. Hmm. And I was like, that's indestructible life. Like that's, there's something in hope and in faith that this little kid had. Wow. And like, what the fuck are we complaining about? Hmm. So there was this like, how do you do justice to like that kind of heart. How do you, how do you like honor that? It's like, yeah. well, you go to suffer camp and you don't complain yeah. and you show people that a 16 year old could be raped multiple times a night and still have the heart to go and care for other people. Like hmm. that's who we are. Hmm. Let's be that. Hmm. So to put it out there, like we got to do this. My pledge to this person was I won't stop sharing. You've asked me to share because there's so many other people going through what you're going through and yeah. what you're going through is horrible. Hmm. And you're like, charging me. Don't forget. Hmm. That's my motivation. So now I'm on this thing. It's like my leg doesn't work and I'm, everyone knows yeah. <laughs> filming me, you know, it's like runner's world does an article. Like I can't quit. Like what the <laughs> hell am I going to do? Like right. this dude is a chicken and yeah. he gave up. Like, so for me, it sucks because in my own running, I know that I know that on some level, what was given to me by my family, by my culture and my community is a level of character mm -hmm. and you, you have to endure. Yeah. You just deal with it. But for this, this was, this was in like memory of, this was mm. for the benefit of a person that asked me to remember them. And so hmm. wow. It's just a long, that's a long winded way of just saying like, this was in the service of something higher. Yeah. And so my bullshit doesn't matter. Yeah. It just got compartmentalized to like, you're just going to keep going. And mm -hmm. you know that it's like, it's seven or eight days. Yeah. You can suffer through this, man. What is this? A few days? Like, come on, man. Like yeah. you, you just get up and you're just going to keep moving. So yeah. I know there's mental fortitude in that. That's built up through the training. It's like, I put a lot of time on these feet. It yeah. sucks that it broke. Right. But we're going, we're going like my kids are watching. My family's here. People are championing us. I got homies that flew in, you know, from yeah. like out of state and yeah. like walked with me. And it's yeah. like, and it, it was doing the thing mm -hmm. I was falling apart, but that was like, no, it's no excuse. Yeah. So that's, I think there was something about my commitment was, this was not, a, it wasn't about, it was like, I want people to pay attention mm. and, and, and there's all this, there's a lot of, you know, political BS and nonsense around this issue. But the reality was like, I know, I know people that went through this and they asked me to care. That's why I'm here. Mm. So kind of like, <laughs> this isn't, this isn't the stuff that people are like arguing about in the political realm. This is like teenage girls being raped repeatedly. So yeah. if you have a problem with that, like, fuck you a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. I'm going to go. Yeah. And so I think that like kind of defiant 
punk rock DIY hardcore, like who cares, man? Yeah. I know that there's a finish line here. I know I'm going to get there. I have support. I've got people and I've also put myself out there. I'm finishing what I started. Hmm. That's a bit more of a pull than maybe it, it, that's what is missing. I'm probably missing part of your question because just mm. for the love of finishing a rate for the love of yeah. the work, no. that's not where I was. Like I loved it, yeah, but I, I had to finish No, most. So in the world of ultra running, we, it's often you talk about the why, you know, why are, oh, why are yeah. you doing it? I do think what's interesting about you compared to like, you know, the average ultra runner is that you started with the why and then you figured out the what <laughs> we usually are like, what we want to run a hundred miles. Well, why? And you got to go do soul searching to figure it out. You had this, hmm. you had a mission, you had yeah, yeah, a yeah. vision, you had a purpose. And you're like, yeah. how do I get this out into the world more? I could run and get publicity hmm. around these things that matter. Is that true? Yeah. And also the beauty, the utilitarian nature of just running, throwing some yeah. shoes, man. Yeah. It's the best. Like you just... You can be a runner. Yeah. Put your shoes on and walk out the door. You did it, dude. <laughs> you like it. you're in it. You're like right. yeah. that's what I love about who is it? Bart Yaza. It was just these people that are like, yo, you don't gotta be fast. Yeah, them, you yeah. just gotta show up. Right. And so it's like, I knew every if I could do that, could I get moms mm. like Chrissy that care about kids that are like, I don't know what to do. This yeah. is too big of a problem. It's yeah. like, well, participate. That's it. Hmm. We don't need you to do a bunch. Well, it's a long ending an injustice is a lot like, it's not even like an ultra. It is like a run across the <laughs> state. I mean, it's like way too big for yeah. one person. Yeah. So participate. That yeah. was it. It was just like how, that's what's beautiful about running yeah. is anyone can yeah. participate and you don't need a bunch of gear. Right. You don't need a lot of stuff. Yeah. It's like you just throw on some really short shorts, hopefully, <laughs> right? And some a tank top and a little net hat, you know what I'm saying? And like yeah. denim cut off shorts, you know, whatever, there are people. And, and just run that yeah. marathon, baby. But that's, so that's it. It was like, I knew that people could get involved. I don't skateboard. I'm not cool. Yeah. I run. I can, I can jog. I yeah. could walk. Yeah. And I needed to. And so it's like, I ran when I could run. Yeah. I, I hobbled when I could hobble. I jogged when I could jog, but I, I did it. And mm. so I wanted other people to know there was a way to like, to do that too. So yeah. it is as much about, you know, the, what was, I know people will get this. Yeah. They know it's hard. They know it's hard to run a lot. Yeah. You know, it's, people, they can connect that. They can connect that what you're doing is hard. And and then, and, and there's curiosity that comes with, well, well, why in the world would you do that? Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. And maybe they go, why well, I could do that. Especially yeah. now that it's so, everyone can be so much more connected, you know, through, like different running groups and stuff like that. It's like, yeah. oh, you can jump in. Yeah. You can find community and, and some support yeah. to do hard things. Yeah. And that was it. What was your support <clears throat> system like during that? I mean, you talked about the sprinter yeah. vans, like who, the, you, had, you had a bunch of people. How many people in total were out in, you know, out on the pavement with you? I think at the biggest, there's a group in Southern Utah and they, there was a running, there was a running store in either city Cedar or I think it was in Cedar. Anyways, there was a group of ultra dudes that showed up the last wow, couple days. Really? Yeah. And they ran with me my okay. last like 17 miles. Okay. And then they were running that night for one of the dude's birthdays uh -huh. to every McDonald's in St. George. <laughs> like this okay. like insane people. It's a great snapshot. It was like, that was it. And they're like with their kids, like two of them had yeah. strollers and they're just like, yeah, man, we're just going to go to McDonald's and yeah. I'm going to get a. I'm going to eat at every single one of them. And I was like, what's your mileage going to be for yeah. the day? They're like, I don't know, like 30, 38, maybe yeah. 40 something. I was like, you guys are out of control. And yeah. they're like, yo. And then that's a good snapshot of the community. <laughs> yeah. There's they like just a, showed up. They did. I didn't know who they were. I'm like running. And all yeah. of a sudden, like some dude shows yeah. up and I'm like, hey. And then like two or three more. And Gotta then like three or four more. Yeah. And it Gotta was get awesome. the miles in. So Southern Utah was the funnest. I really? had, that's cool. You know, we have a business part. We have a business partner named Brian that flew in. Mm -hmm. He landed in Vegas, drove up and parked on the side of the freeway and then like walked with me and he stayed for one night. So he was there for two days. Yeah. Homies flew in from Texas. Friends drove down from Salt Lake. Yeah. People showed up like a lot of my dear friends showed up to just be with me. Yeah. And my uncle Dwight, who lives in Washington, he finished the second half of it with me. He runs for oh. World Vision. He'll do oh. fundraising runs for World Vision for clean water. And oh, he's cool. a manager at Costco. So he just tells people, Hey, I'm running for, I'm running for world vision. Do you want to contribute? And in one Seattle marathon, he's raised 10, $15,000. Oh man. And so I was like, dude, you you want to do this with me? And he's like, I was going to run this other marathon, but 
I, I would, I will do that with you. And I was yeah. like, really? And yeah. so he came down and he was just going to do a few days, but he's like, I'm staying. And he finished yeah. the race with me. So I had, I had family. I can't say enough about like Chrissy and my kids because the training protocol, I'm going from zero to like hours away all yes. the time. I don't love that. Yeah. And, and I'm sure she didn't love that either. Yeah. And she's super strong and like independent and stuff. But like, that sucks when you're sure. like every Saturday for the next three months, I'm going to yeah. wake up and my husband's going to be gone until yeah. I mean, there's <laughs> he crawls a reason back in and then treats me like an asshole for the rest yeah. of the day because he, he's in a calorie deficit, hasn't <laughs> drinking anything but water <laughs> on foot. And I'm like what a jerk, you know? So I do have pickles right here. Dog, that's what I'm saying. I, I thought about putting out aid station food for us Bro, here. Just Rice Krispie treats but, all day. I mean, that's why I, th I think, yeah, you're Chrissy's husband, but you know, when you're talking about that, you're her partner in yeah. life as well. Like, yes, that's, that's, I talk about it a lot. Like that's one of my mental challenges to get over is like, I feel like I'm leaving my wife hanging as I'm a partner. Mm. Like she's carrying the weight of three kids. I'm out, you know, running at the top of Maslow's heart hierarchy, like self-actualization. I'm so in my suffering. I'm so happy. I'm in the middle of the desert and she's got the three kids. Yeah. That'll mess with my head. You know? Yes. But yeah, so I mean, just for hmm. a, a snapshot of the amount of support that you had, I mean, that Brian that you mentioned earlier is from Corn, mm -hmm. and he flew out to support you. Like there was, there was yeah. a lot of people who were interested in this thing. I met yeah. you short. I mean, literally, this was 2018. Mm -hmm. We we met the uh, on the phone this maybe the summer after that. Yeah, I was in Amsterdam, and I remember walking yeah. around and and Asher was like, "Yeah, talk to my buddy." That's cool. Um, so, I mean, you had a lot of support. I had a lot of support because I'm not a runner. Like, I'm just not, <laughs> they're all worried. I be doing, yeah, they're like, what is he doing? Like, this yeah. moron is doing. Oh, God, we better but get I, over there. I want to say this, too, though, because of what you just said. Like, I think, I think that it's good that we worry mm. and stress about our family that is behind. I think that's part of the thing. Yeah. I think it'd be a little, I, and I, I'm sure some of like the, will you hit the low button? Uh, I don't know. If I'm, it, it may only work okay. Just say, I'm, I'm sure, sure that, that some, some of the, like say peak performers, peak performers. Yeah, they don't think about it. Right. Like they're, they're like, I'm gone and they need to handle it. And they, yeah. they just do. I don't care about that. Yeah. I, I'd rather be a guy that's like, I, I worry about my, yeah. wife, my wife is not managing this stuff. That's also like real life. Right. You know? Right. It's like, yeah, bro. Like I run and like, I don't even think about it. It's like, dog, you're a psychopath. <laughs> yeah. And that's yeah. a jerk move. Of the bro. two of us. Yes. I would rather be me <laughs> yeah. worried about my wife and kids and yeah. what they're managing than right. just like in it, bro. Like, oh, I got to get the miles. For what? Man? Yeah. Right. That's home. Right. This is the adventure. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Like, so, but yeah, there was a ton of support and that was, that also added to the, like, you know, the help and the pull. Yeah. Yeah. So I do think it's important. It's like, it's not good. <laughs> you know, we do a lot of this stuff. It's, it's the, the, um, the loneliness of the long distance runner. Right. Yeah. But it's not good for us to be alone, man. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's like, I don't think that you should endeavor to, to live that kind of life. Like yeah. as like John Wick esque, like I need no one. It's like, dude, you're full of shit, dog. Come yeah. on. Like everybody needs somebody yeah. and we are best when we are supporting one yeah. another. I think that's, that's what I liked about, that's what I like about the running community anyway, is just like, I, I was blown away yeah. at like people that would just show up. Yeah. And it's like, what are you doing here? And they're like, right. we, I've never met these people and they're like, yeah. we're just going to run with you for the day. And I'm like, I'm like Forrest Gump, this is wild. Like, what is happening? <laughs> so that was that was also motivation. It's like I can suffer well. Yeah. I'm not alone. I just have to do it. No yeah. one's gonna do it for me, but I I I can keep going. Yeah. I hope that that can be a speed somebody that's about to attempt their first 50 yeah. or their first hundred is like, yeah. wait a minute. It's important that I do this, but I that, that fortitude piece, man, it's hard. Yeah. You know, you hit those breaking points and it's like, yeah. your brain's like, you're, you're killing yourself. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> stop now. Yeah. And you're stop. like, I, I can't. Yeah. And, and, and if you're tied to a purpose and I, and a few people I've interviewed hmm. have been that way. I think of the episode one with a woman named Elsa Jaworski. Hmm. She talked about tying her, like she, she got second at the Tahoe 200 miler. Whoa. She just got, 
I think second at the cold water rumble hundred miler in Arizona. She's great. She's what fast. Boss. I know. <laughs> uh, but she ties it. Uh, I, I want to get this right to some, there's a diabetes connection mm-hmm. that she runs on behalf of and, uh, Alzheimer's. Yes. And they mean something to her. And so, you know, when you get into those dark spots, like you remember for her, her, why she's connecting it to, a, I, you know, that's why I, yes. I, I'm motivated by that, telling that story. And so there, there's this, there's this interesting thing that it still feels, it still feels irrational to me because if all we wanted to do was highlight a cause, <laughs> there are other ways to do it. <laughs> That are, I don't want to say easier. I'm a marketing minded person, so maybe easier to me. Yeah. Running 100 miles, there's there's still something, no matter how connected it is to a why, there's still, still something about it that's absurdly see, absurdly selfish yeah. in, in a way that we have to make peace with, that it's okay to want something. Yeah, that's true. That is true. Uh, but I also, I will say this though, man, I think, and I think that's just the anarcho vein that mm. runs through the running community since yeah. well i'll just say maybe the american running boom yeah you have these badasses that are like no yeah <laughs> we are gonna do this unconventional sport that makes sense to none of you yeah we're still kind of punk rock and yes. so i will say that that in an age where there's such disconnection to our bodies to one another to the world around us. Yeah. There's something kind of punk about people going like, I'm going outside. <laughs> You're right. For, for right. how long? Yeah. Man, I don't know. See you later. Pal. And I won't have reception. <laughs> yeah. And I don't care. Yeah. It's like, Oh, like yeah. there's something about that, that I think we, we need, you know, hunters, we need, we need people that are going to be tactile in their interests. Yes. And so the idea, yeah, you're totally right. hundred percent selfish. Yeah. You're a dick. Yeah. But what I'm saying is <laughs> this is, it's also necessary. Yeah. Like, why yeah. do you think it's exploding? It's because yeah. people are not connected. Yeah. And so I just think, dude, like we need, I thought about it a lot on the run. Like we need radical action. Yeah. We need two weeks of crazy. Like yes. I kept thinking like everybody needs to do two weeks of nuts because yeah. it will forever alter your life. Yeah. Like I'm in this two week journey and I've just changed my entire family's story. Yeah. Two weeks. That was yeah. it. I haven't done any, I haven't done that since. Yeah. But my kids are like, remember your run? Mm-hmm. And like, it's, it's in there. Mm-hmm. Like they're like, yeah, yeah, dad part and of mom did the a thing. The family story. That's interesting. It's I'm trying to leave a legacy. I also want I'm trying to bear witness and I know my people are watching. Yeah. How do you inspire? How do you, it's like we do yeah. audacious things. Yeah. So I would also say in the in this kind of like digital quasi information age. Yeah. Dude, put on your shoes and go outside where it's cold. Yeah. Like yeah. deal. Yeah. Learn yeah, yeah. to deal. Yeah. Because it's like, keep it in the comments. That is yeah. not real. That's yeah. not real. Yeah. Like, so I also kind of applaud the insanity of a bunch of normal people going like, I'm running a hundred miles. Having ambition. Like <laughs> it's yeah. Like, why? Yeah. No reason. God, I don't know. I don't know why. <laughs> I just need a lot but of But it's time. like, it's, it's so cliche, but, but John Muir, whatever you say it, like mm-hmm. the, the mountains are calling and I must go like it's, it's everywhere, but it's like, oh. God, it's so good. It's so real. It's like, there's something about that's calling. It's like urging. I want to go out there and run 10 miles. And then you do it and you're like, I could have gone further. I could have gone further. And you just do it until you reach your max. I would say that, and I'm just going to say this because I'm a Jesus magic weirdo. I think that all of these things, pleasure, pain, sex, fulfillment, wealth, riches, all of it, even in its height. I finished a 200 mile race first place. That's the whisper Mm -hmm. of, I think, the, the love of our of God in our spirits going like heaven is way deeper than anything you can touch. Hmm. You're just getting a, you're in the tip of the ocean Hmm. of what like God is like, Hmm. and you guys are touching it and you feel like, dude, this is insane. And it's like preschool. I think Hmm. eternity is so cool to me. Hmm. All the stuff we're chasing, even awesome radical things. I'm like, it's this big compared to some of the, like the whispers of like the love of God that I felt. So even in my hmm. radical, like, let's be radical. It's like, we're like a little kid, like I'm radical. Like that's it. That's what we do. And it's yeah. like, Oh, we're defying this like capitalistic structure, bro. Like, no, yeah. we just, you ran for four hours yeah. by yourself and like six people saw it. One yeah. dude threw yeah. a beer can at you. You're not that your cool. Your shoes cost 450 yeah. bucks and yeah. they have a carbon st- plate in them. Yeah. 
too. You are not <laughs> radical. <laughs> You're not radical at all. Also, have fun pulling your toenails off, you yeah. nerd. Okay. No one wears that color. What's the matter with you? Um, so I just, I think in general, like all of these pursuits, when people are looking for a why, that I'm just saying, yeah. you can find a cause. Yeah. I, I would that people, I hope that people in that journey, that solitary space, plunging the depths of kind of what am I capable of? Yeah. I, I hope that just like with me, that was also a space where I felt, I felt connected to the spirit of God yeah. in a way that I'd never had before. And hmm. so I hope that not just the human spirit, but I wonder if there's a whisper of spirituality that people are really looking for. And, and I hope that in a pursuit of something crazy, yeah, that kind of God like sneaks up on them and is like, Hey, come on. This is you just cracking the door of, of what's actually waiting for you, which is profound fulfillment. Mm. You're not going to, you know what I mean? So it's like, we find these fulfilling moments in challenging what we think is possible. Mm. And I think on the other side of that, I think it's a spiritual quest. Yeah. That's what I think It's like, ultimately I think yeah. this is all spiritual, but yeah. you can't say that crap on a podcast. You know what I'm saying? You're probably gonna have to edit this out. You, you know said I mean? it. <laughs> 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 I'm just saying all of it. It's it's all, the the mountains are calling. Yeah, I, must go. I, I don't. I, would, th I don't think anybody would disagree that it's that there's like you saying like this this spiritual quest. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean vision quest, whatever. It's like there's something no one deep would, yeah. in there, man. That's like yeah, maybe the elites who are like you know engaged in like you know crushing steroids. it out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There is a new uh, Enhanced Games. Have you seen this? Peter Thiel invested in it. Oh, gosh. It's called the Enhanced Games. You can take whatever, whatever you, you want. want. <laughs> Let's see, bro. Let's see you walk on water. Yeah. Let's go, There's bro. There's like this little tiny five foot eight guy that just beat uh, I love the it. Jamaican I, guy's world record. I love it. He's like, yo, let's put carbon plates in your feet. <laughs> yeah. Let's. Okay. So you've got, a, you've got a book in front of you. Do you yes, want to say I anything do. about it yeah, before we wrap is, up? So the, it's not even out for resale yet, but Chrissy, okay. Chrissy Green wrote a book about the story of us meeting this girl. Whoa, the, okay. the origin story of Run Against Traffic. Nice. And it's called Many More Like Me. Okay. So that'll be out, I think, in the next month on Amazon, online, and stuff like that. And you'll see that. And if you want to support um, what Run Against Traffic does is we just we, – we do everything we can to raise money, mm -hmm. and then we get that to American-based aftercare. So when people come out, if they don't have quality aftercare, like 90% of them go back. Mm. And it's an emerging problem. Yeah. Like it's an emerging solution. Yeah. So it's going to take a long time. It's an ultra run. It's not a marathon. Yeah. It's going to take my lifetime to see if we can actually make a difference. But mm. for people coming out, they need job placement. They need medical, physical, psychological help. Mm. They need resource. It's like yeah. they're a person that needs to not have to sell a part of themselves to make money. So yeah. it's, it's expensive and it's extensive. So running in traffic raises money and gets it to American based aftercare. Okay. So for my birthday, like last month, mm -hmm. we raised like five grand for my birthday and we just sent that. Dang. So it's like, we just, we just try to create avenues. So running is a way business is a way we yeah. do rock shows, bro. Rock yeah. against traffic, yeah. baby. Yeah. So all that stuff. So if you want to support, <laughs> um, aftercare yeah. for human trafficking survivors, go to IRunningAgainstTraffic.com. I run against traffic.com. Okay. We'll put it in the, in the show I, notes. I, I, run, I ran, I, 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 I want you to, but promise me that run against on the highway, did you run Did you run against traffic on the highway? Were you on the, you run with traffic? I had traffic. to run with traffic on okay. that one, but, but there that was, URL was already taken, but it was already taken. <laughs> run with traffic in Utah was already <laughs> taken, com. but there was a space in St. George outside of St. George where there was essentially seven miles that you couldn't run. Okay. And so I had to stop, mm. get in a car. They drove us down to the next spot. We ran seven miles, stopped for the day, and then came back for the final day and started back where we started and ran the seven miles that we couldn't run on the uh, freeway. So I really did the distance, did but the, the highway patrol was like, you cannot run here. And you I was like, can't. I'm going to run here. And my mom's like, I'll kill you if you run here. <laughs> so I was like, I'm going to run on the road. And she's yeah. like, no. So anyway, so I run against traffic.com. Okay. Many more like me is the book. Josh nice. Rosenthal, thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, Tommy, thanks for coming. I'm going to play some music. I've never done this live, but I'm not going to say anything over this one. <laughs>